Hey guys, it's Sam. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are having an amazing day. For today's video, as you guys can see by the title down there, today we are talking about Dennis Nilsson. I do want to mention I did create a video kind of like um, request form. It's going to be linked down in the description box. Is a form that you just are going to fill out and just let me know if there's any cases that you would want me to cover and um, I'll give you guys a shout out for the you know video idea. So before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe and little button down there and if you want to know more about Dennis Nelson, then just keep on watching. Today is gonna be a long story, so buckle up. Dennis Andrew Nelson was born November 23rd, 1945, in Fraserburg, Scotland. Dennis' father was named Olav Magnus Nelson, and he was Norway, Nor, Norwegian soldier. I'm sorry. Um, today I am gonna have a little bit of trouble pronouncing some words. If you not know English is my second language, if you can't tell by my accent. Um, so yeah, I may have a little bit of trouble pronouncing some of the words. He was evacuated from Scotland after the Nazis had uh, conquered his home country in World War World War Two. His mom, Dennis's mom, was the daughter of a local fisherman and she was, and her name was Elizabeth Duty Wife and they married in May 1942. Dennis's parents actually married against their parents' opinion and together they had three children. They had two sons and a daughter. Dennis's brother was named Olaf Jr. and then Dennis. And Dennis's sister was named Sylvia. Dennis's dad unfortunately was never interested in having a family. Um, so they actually did divorce in 1948. So just three years after Dennis was born. The result of Dennis's parents divorcing the paternal role model was kind of taken over by Dennis's maternal grandfather as a young child Dennis was extremely close to his grandfather Andrew unfortunately on October 31st just about a month before Dennis's eighth birthday his grandfather passed away from a heart attack and this happened while he was actually fishing in the North Sea his body was brought back for a burial service and Dennis's mother actually let Dennis look at the body um, also he was about to turn eight years old so he was pretty young and the mom let him see the body and she actually told him that his grandpa was sleeping like she didn't actually explain you know that he had passed away and even like the definition of like death obviously the loss of his grandfather which he was extremely close with um had an effect on dennis's personality and it was very apparent that he was starting to change he became extremely quiet and he started um, just isolating himself from his family. 1955 during one of those excursions that he would take um, to the harbor, Dennis actually fell in the water and he said that he panicked at first but eventually he calmed down and he actually believed that you know he was having a near-death experience so he actually believed that his grandfather was coming to get him. He was then pulled out of the water by some other boys that were around there. Shortly after this incident, um, his mom actually remarried and the family moved to an inland village named Stricken. With the onset of puberty, 
Um, Dennis actually realized that he wasn't heterosexual, he wasn't straight. He was unsure whether he was either gay or bisexual because the boys he was attracted to had a more feminine um, characteristics and he said that they even looked like his sister. Dennis decided he was actually going to live stricken and he was going to join the army just, just at the age of 14. His first destination was a city in West Germany. This is where Dennis started dr heavily drinking and he said that he actually started drinking so that he it would help him socialize and just not be so shy. He recalls that one time he passed out from drinking at one of his friend's apartment. That although no sexual activity happened he actually fantasized about having sex while unconscious this kind of became the source of dennis's fantasy to engage in sex with the art the other person would be immobile or even unconscious also pretend to pass out in like on the floor of his friend's apartment in hopes that one of his friends, male friends, would make sexual advances towards him. In 1967, Dennis was actually redeployed to South Yemen and he was assigned to the Al-Mansura Al prison. The violence from the pro-independence groups led to the abductions of some of Dennis's army companions. Dennis himself was actually almost abducted in one of those occasions by a local taxi driver. The taxi driver had actually knocked Dennis unconscious and put him in the trunk of the car. Dennis gained conscious before they got to the actual destination where the, truck driver, the taxi driver was taking him. And when the abductor opened the trunk, Dennis was actually able to knock him out with a jack with a jack handle and beat him until he was unconscious. In his own room, Dennis would actually simulate having sex with a male partner in front of a mirror. Now his fantasies became more and more apparent when he actually discovered a painting that called the Raft of the Medusa and I'll put a picture here. And it's basically, as you guys can see, um, a ship and it has a lot of like naked dead bodies on it following a brief stay in Cyprus and Britain once he got to Germany he actually hired a sex worker a female sex worker so that he could have sex with a woman for the first time in his life Dennis says that he found the experience depressing and this is where he realized that he was actually gay Dennis retired from the army in 1972 and he made his way back to Stricken, where his family was from or where they moved after mom remarried. Once he was there, ma his mom would actually, you know, ask him why he didn't have no interest in women. A few months later, Dennis and his brother attended a group watching of a documentary that was around about homosexuality and after the and people there after the documentary ended they were talking about the film and they were voicing you know their opinions in regards to gay rights and except for dennis of course because you know he was gay after this a fight between him and his brother actually took place after you know they left the place and after that unfortunately dennis's brother told his mom told their mom that dennis was gay after this, obviously there was a strain, you know, in the family, the brothers were not talking and eventually Dennis, late that December, he left stricken and moved to London. I mean, who wouldn't, you know? You never out anybody. It's not your responsibility, it's not your say, it's none of your business. After graduating from the academy, this is when Dennis started frequenting more gay pubs. Dennis did have several brief relationships with men 
um, but unfortunately those would just end so he never actually had a long-term relationship and this made him believe that he was unfit for relationships now we're gonna start talking about his crimes and so trigger warning this may be a little bit graphic now Dennis's victims most of them were either students or homeless men um, that he would pick up at bars or just on the streets and he would either offer them you know he would offer them a place to stay food even money sometimes and he would strangle and drown his victims and he would actually wake up with little memory of what he had done just because he would get blackout drunk he actually used his butchering skills that he had learned in the army in order to get rid of the bodies Dennis's first murder took place on December 30th, 1978. Dennis actually claims that he met this victim at a gay bar. He strangled him with a necktie until he was unconscious and then drowned him in his bathtub. On January 12th, 2006, they actually said that this victim was only 14 years old. Between the first and second murder, Dennis actually attempted to murder a student from Hong Kong, but fortunately the student was able to get away. Although the student was asked by police about what had happened, he decided to not press any charges and Dennis was able to walk away. Dennis attacked the second victim, which was a Canadian student, on December 3rd, 1979. Again, during the sexual intercourse, Dennis actually strangled the victim. And actually, this victim was one of the few victims that was actually reported as a missing person. Dennis's third victim was a 16-year-old boy who was homeless from Bir Birkenhead. And in May 1980, he actually accepted the invitation from Dennis to go back to his place. And this is where he strangled and drowned the boy. The next victim was a sex worker from Scotland. Fortunately, his body was never identified, so nobody knew, you know, his name or who he was. The fifth victim was another sex worker who unfortunately was never identified either. Um, it was only known that he was either from Thailand or the Philippines. For the next few victims, Dennis actually said that he could recall very little information about them. All that he could recall was that the sixth victim was a Irish worker that he had met at a bar. Now for victims six through 10, Dennis says that he actually has little to no memory about them and the only one was victim number six uh, that he remembers that he was an Irish worker that he had met at a local gay bar. Now the 11th victim was a skinhead that Dennis had picked up at Piccadilly Circus who had a neck tattoo like right around here that said cut here for this victim Dennis actually hung his torso in his bedroom for about 24 hours before Dennis buried his body under the floorboards now at some point between victims 6 and 11 there was another victim that fortunately got away from Dennis on November 10th, 1980. And this victim says that he woke up while Dennis was strangling him and he was able to defend himself. Unfortunately, um, this incident was actually labeled as a domestic disagreement between two K lovers um, by the police. So there was no persecution um, against Dennis, unfortunately. I feel like this is like the second incident where he could have been caught and a lot of people would have been alive and just because you know they were gay based on their sexual orientation they were just 
you know, discarding them, which is so, so unfortunate. Now, the 12th victim was the last victim before Dennis actually moved houses or moved where he lived. And this attack happened on September 18th, 1981. Dennis found this victim in a doorway and on his way home, he went ahead and called an ambulance for him. And the next day when this person was released, he actually went to thank Dennis. And he was pleased to be invited in, so Dennis actually invited him into his home. Unfortunately, Dennis murdered him that same night. After moving to a new house in Muswell Hill in October 1981, Dennis met another student in Soho and of course invited him back to his place. Now, with this student, he actually woke up the next morning so Dennis did not kill him. And he actually went to the doctor because he woke up with some weird neck bruises. Now, the doctor did let him know that it appeared that he had been strangled and he recommended him for him to go to the police. Now, unfortunately, based on his sexual orientation, the student was afraid that he was going to be judged and he decided not to go. Following that attempted murder, Dennis actually met a drag queen in a pub in Camden. And after passing out from strangulation, he actually came back while Dennis was trying to drown him. And he was actually able to fight him off and got away. Now in 1981, Dennis actually moved to an apartment that was on the upstairs floor. And because he found it difficult to get rid of the bodies, he had like suitcases with human organs stored in his like closet and I actually found a picture that they when he got he got arrested um, they found like bags inside his closet which is like mind-blowing as well as uh, plastic bags with human remains underneath the floorboards now the next victim was actually the first victim that Dennis um, murdered in his new home in December of 1981 he was actually one of the few ones that actually fought back while Dennis was trying to kill him. However, obviously Dennis got even more upset and he decided that he needed to die. So after a huge fight, while Dennis was actually strangling him, the victim tried to strangle him back. But then eventually Dennis ended up drowning him. Now his body were was dismembered and obviously some of his parts were actually flushed down the toilet or even buried underneath the floorboards and various places of the actual apartment now dennis's next victim which this is victim 14th he was actually a homeless man that dennis had met in Shav shazbury avenue and after murdering him actually dennis left his body in his bath unsure of how he was going to dispose of it after about three days dennis went ahead and dismembered the body now dennis's final victim was a drug addict they met in oxford street where the victim actually begged dennis for a hamburger and dennis actually suggested that they should go back to his place so after a long night of drugs and alcohol Dennis ended up strangling the victim and dismembering his body. Now with this victim, Dennis actually noticed that the victim had um, bandages around his wrists and when he removed them, he saw um, that he had cuts. So he assumed that the victim had actually tried to kill himself before. So with this victim, Dennis actually bathed him and then he placed like mirrors around the dead body and he actually got in the bath and like laid with him after several hours um dennis kissed the body and wished it good night and fell asleep alongside it now it was this victim's dismembered body parts um that were found in the drain outside of dennis's home and this is where the the police were first alerted of what was inside the drains let's take a look at his mo which is kind of like the modus operandis it's called and it's basically did 
and it's basically what he did to the victims so dennis would actually like i mentioned before he would strangle the victims until they were either dead or unconscious he would actually retain the bodies for a couple of weeks um, days or weeks before actually getting rid of the bodies at some point he also boiled the heads hands and feet of the victims now on february 4th 1983 dennis actually complained that the drains were clogged and which i don't understand because he was the one that was flushing down remains of human human remains down the toilet but he complained and that's when they sent a plumber and then they realized that there were like bones and so when the plumber asked his supervisor he was concerned obviously that what he had found so they decided to go back the next morning but the drain was already cleared and obviously they got suspicious so they decided to examine what they had found in the drain and that they were indeed human remains. Now when they actually examined the pipes um, leading to the drain, they actually, you know, found bones and scraps of flesh. And it was coming down from the pipe that was in the upstairs um, apartment. So after informing police, a pathologist actually confirmed that the bodies were human. And then as three officers waited outside of Dennis's home. So when the officers were waiting for Dennis to come home, he came home and they went upstairs to his apartment. They were waiting for Dennis um, outside his apartment. They actually could smell the decomposing body at his front door. And when Dennis got home, the police actually asked him where the remains of the body were. And he actually led them to one of the close closets where there were bags with human remains. Now, when the police asked him, you know, what had happened, he said that it was a long story and that he would tell them at the police station. So they took him into the police station so that he could tell his story. Now, when they were driving in the car, taking Dennis to the police station one of the officers actually asked him if the remains belonged to either one or two people and as he looked out the window he said 15 or 16 and he went on to say since 1978 implying that he had killed 15 or 16 people since 1978 so once they got to the police station uh, it wasn't long after Dennis made a full confession and actually led them to the lot where he had hid um, a lot of the bodies um, in his before home. So not where the drains got clogged, uh, but the house he used to live before that. However, um, when asked, he did say that he didn't have any intention of killing right up until the moment that it was about to happen. And he also claims that he also claimed that he ignore the reason why he would murder these men and he was hoping um, to see if the police were able to tell him why he did kill these men. After the confession, Dennis was held at the Brixton prison pending trial. Here, this is where he wrote over 50 notebooks with his memories and basically the crimes in order to help the police who also drew some sketches which he also would refer to sad sketches which detailed everything that he did to the bodies the prosecution relied primarily on the interview notes from his arrest which took over four hours to read verbatim to the jury and they actually included the testimony of the three victims that actually were able to get away from Dennis. Physical evidence included in Dennis's trial were photographs of the crime scenes, as well as a chopping board that he would use to dismember the bodies, as well as the cooking pot that he used to boil the skulls, feet, and hand of the victims. There is a museum called the Black Museum at Scotland Yard. Yard. There's actually a museum in 
there's actually a museum called the Black Museum in Scotland Yard where you can actually see these um, objects which are displayed. Now, you would ask yourself, you know, what did the defense have? Like, in that case, him, you know, with his testimony and his confession of all the murders, like, how did the defense had a case, you know? So, they primarily depended on the testimony of two psychiatrists, which was Dr. James McKeith and Dr. Patrick Galway. Dr. McKeith actually described Dennis's troubled childhood with his, in his inability to express feelings and the resulting separation of mental function from physical function, which affected Dennis's sense of identity. Under obviously intense examination of the prosecution, however, Dr. McKeith was forced to retract his judgment about dementia responsibility. So he was basically trying to say that Dennis, um, based on his troubled childhood, um, that's why he did what he did. The second psychiatrist, Dr. Galway, actually diagnosed Nielsen with false self syndrome, which indicated, which was characterized by outbreaks of schizoid disturbances, which made him capable of premeditation. But most of Dr. Galway's testimony was extremely technical. It even gave the judge a cause to question Galway's complex diagnosis. Now, the prosecution actually brought Dr. Paul Bowden as a bureau psychiatrist who had spent considerable amount with Dennis in order to obviously talk about the, others, uh, the other psychiatrist's diagnosis. Dennis was actually... He stated that Dennis was manipulative with some signs of abnormality, mental abnormality, but nevertheless, he was uh, cognizant of and responsible for the crimes that he had committed. Now, after all the diagnoses and testimonies from the psychiatrist, the judge actually did not take into consideration the diagnosis, and he actually said that a mind can be evil without being abnormal. November 4th, 1983, Dennis was actually found guilty of six murders and one attempted murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Now, the possibility of parole was completely eliminated in 1994 by Home Secretary Michael Howard, who replaced Dennis's sentence with one of whole life order. Dennis reacted to the news by saying that he accepted his life sentence and had no desire to be free again. On May 12th, 2018, Dennis passed away from complications from a surgery at the age of 72 while incarcerated at the full Sutton prison in East Yorkshire was actually transferred on May 10th to the hospital suffering from abdominal pain and during the procedure Dennis suffered a blood clot and later passed away the autopsy ruled that his cause of death was pulmonary embolism and retroperitoneal hemorrhage and he died so that is it for today's video. I hope you guys learned something. I need to stop saying um, I hope you guys enjoyed because I'm pretty sure you guys don't quite enjoy listening to these like horrible stories but maybe just enjoy spending time with me. Um, but yeah, that is it for today's story. Everything that I used in today's video will be linked down in the description box as well as all of my social media. And until then, I'll see you guys on my next one. Bye!